Uh, the presentation I'm going to do today, I did pass out a, a PowerPoint handout, is identity and colonialism. I'm going to cover a lot of things because it's really hard to talk about identity without talking about genocide, colonialism, white supremacy, and all of that. So I'm going to cover a wide range of topics and issues, so bear with me. Identity. Um, how we choose to identify ourselves reflects the knowledge and understanding that we have or that we don't have of our history. An identity tells a story, connects you to a culture, reflects your values, and most importantly, how you connect to this world. We as Mexican, Central American, Native Americans, Nicantlaca people, we are a mess when it comes to identity. We have no clue who we are. We go based on what our grandparents tell us, what our parents tell us, what Cristina tells us, what Don Francisco tells us. We are in a big cloud of confusion, so it's really difficult for us to even try to understand who we are without a strong foundation of knowledge of who we are in a non-Eurocentric way. We in the Mexica movement, uh, the biggest aspect of our organization is to clarify the issue of identity for our people because we've been tired. We're tired of being lied to over 500 years. We're, being, we're told what to call ourselves. We're told what to eat. We're told what is beautiful. We're told what is pretty. We're told what is ugly. We're told what is justice. We're told what is right and what is wrong. And we're tired of it. And we in the Mexica movement, we're taking a very organized approach to all this. And identity is the biggest um, factor in reclaiming your liberation and being a free people. People that don't have freedom don't have the freedom to call themselves who they are, to reflect their heritage. And enslaved people are people who are told who they are and who are given options. And the options that we are given, obviously, are all colonial. Um, but before, again, we get into identity, we have to understand who are we? Who were we before 1492, 1519? We're talking about being a people who developed civilizations older than the Egyptians. 2600 BCE, we have Peru and Supe Caral. Uh, this civilization is dated 2600 BCE. This is Charles Mann and his book, Before Columbus. And then in that's in that part of Semanahuac. In the part of Anahuac, which we consider Mexico, Central America, part of the U.S. Southwest, Semanahuac, we're trying to compose and we're trying to unite what is known as North America and South America because we, we're trying to get rid of those colonial uh, terms of geography and borders. And then we have in the Omec area, we have 2000 BCE, the Omec civilization, and that was established through corn. What did we do as a free people? What did we do um, since 2600 BCE? What did we do since 2000 BCE? Well, we were one of the first people to originate an original civilization without any contact, without any influence from outer cultures or peoples. We created the world's largest cities of the world, which is Teotihuacan, Tenochtitlan, and Cholula. We were the first people to use the, the concept of zero and decimal point, and we had the world's most accurate calendar. And we also were creators of books, libraries, and the very first people to have mandatory education. Mandatory education meaning females and males were being educated irregardless of your class, irregardless of your status. That was unheard of in the world at that time that we created that concept. If you want to read more about what um, our contributions we provided to the world, we have um, a book that we recommend. I don't think we brought it with us today, but it's called American Indian Contributions to the World by Kiyoki, and you can find that on Amazon, your local library, hopefully. So that will get you more of an idea of who we were um, before 1492 and 1519. It's really important for you to understand what we had established as a people prior to the European invasion because we don't have that point of view. We don't get that information. If you take Chicano studies, they do not start in, uh, with the Olmec. They do not start with uh, the Maya, the Mexica. They start in 1519. They start in 1492. They probably dedicate one chapter or two to what was here before the invasion. And that's a total dishonor to our history. That's a total ripoff of an education that we're receiving in the Chicano Studies program. So we, it's, it's up to us. We have to take the initiative, and unfortunately, we have to take this venue to say, you know what? Our history did not start in 1492. Our history did not start in 1519. We have thousands and thousands of years of, as a people, as a history, with proven contributions, with uh, proven sciences, and the information is there, and we, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to let you guys know that this information does exist. Um, and we have to make sure that we promote it, we get it in the, in the posters, on our website, in the books that we're writing. So just, it's really important that you have a strong sense of knowledge of who we were before 1492. 
Now, what happened in 1492? Why is that such a famous day? We're always talking about 1492. We all know what happened in 1492. Christopher Columbus invaded um, this side of the world, which was, you know, which was populated by our, our ancestors. Um, the book that we recommend that talks about what really took place October 12, 1492, and therefore after, is American Holocaust by David E. Stannard. We don't really recommend this book for you to start off with because if you don't really have a good idea of who you were as a people and you read this book, you're going to get pissed off, you're going to be upset, but you're not really going to understand the psychology of what this genocide meant to our people. So. Um, it is a good book as reference for you to, you know, people say, oh, you're making that up, you know, talk about that book and kind of, you know, go through it. But again, um, it's really important for you to have a strong sense of a knowledge of what happened before 1492. But when you do get to that point and you do say you're writing a, a paper for school or someone's arguing with you, then it is important for you to know your, your facts. And American Holocaust is the best written book that documents what really happened to our people, not only just by philosophy or, or putting things together. This guy, he actually quotes the Europeans you know, year after year, what they wrote about how they killed us, what plans they had. I mean, it's all written. A lot of people think, oh, they're exaggerating, or you know, it, it wasn't really a genocide. That's a whole other debate that is going on right now, where they don't even want to consider it a genocide. There's people that call it, that was, that was just um, uh, an encounter. It was just um, a, a coming of two worlds. There's a lot of euphemisms used to try to really rob the history and rob the experience of what genocide is. And David E. Standard is one of the very first um, authors who's taking a big stand and actually calling it for what it was, which was a genocide. And as you can see, I have a little, um, some quotes there. And one of his most famous quotes is saying, he's saying, indigenous people of the Americas have undergone the worst human holocaust the world had ever witnessed, roaring across two continents nonstop for four centuries and consuming the lives of countless tens of millions of people. Now, what happened during the genocide? Um, it was physical, it was violent, it was a total destruction of our people. But the biggest lie, the biggest farce, the biggest fraud, the historical fraud that has been presented is that our people just happened to be, you know, it was unfortunate that we were, you know, we weren't immune to the smallpox. So they presented in a way that, you know, that sucks, you know, these people weren't immune, so therefore they died. You know, it's a very childish, um, dishonest way to really talk about what happened with the use of uh, biological warfare. And there are a lot of quotes, and we in the Mexica movement, we're working on putting together a good source of, um, for you guys to be able to read, because the argument, it, it's not being made. We're not countering these lies that we're told. The fact that our people die, how, how, do, how do you wipe out 95% of a population within centuries, within decades, within a few um, within a few hundred years? And they said, okay, well, you know, they just happen to die. Like on Wikipedia, there's a, an article I think called the depopulation of Mexico, Central America, um, the de the great decline. And again, these are words that I mean, great decline. You're talking about economics. You're talking about um, you know physical things. You're talking about maybe numbers, maybe you know mortgage, maybe. But they're using these type of words to talk about the killing and the and the intentional use of the slaughter of our people. And that's really upsetting because when you talk about the Jewish Holocaust, no one would ever dare talk about that that was, oh, maybe that was a genocide, you know, the great Jewish decline. I mean, that would be completely absurd if people were to use those terms. But when it comes to talking about our people and what happened to our ancestors, you know, it's, it's okay to talk about it being a decline and it's, it's accepted that the genocide of our ancestors is just seen as a, just another unfortunate historical encounter. And that, that's bullshit. That's not true. That's not the truth. But we don't know that. We can't point to that because we don't have this information. We don't have an information presented to us that is non-Eurocentric. We don't have an education that's presented to us in a way that's going to liberate us from that Eurocentric mindset. And that's one of the arguments that we make in the Mexica movement is that smallpox was indeed used intentionally we have quotes, we have the evidence, it's not being promoted in, in schools, and, and obviously that's gonna be a big dent on the white population occupying our people now because 
Who would like to even know that your ancestors purposely wiped off millions and millions of people from the continent? I mean, that is it's something inhumane, it's something immoral, and that's a discussion that in this culture, this occupying culture of America, they're not willing to have that conversation because it's uncomfortable, because it means that it was done through deceit, that we are actual survivors of the world's largest genocide, and that is something that they don't want to talk about. Obviously, it's not going to benefit them, it's not going to benefit um, the power structure, if we, if we actually start realizing, wait a second, 95% of our people were killed and obviously I'm not white, obviously I'm not European, so that must mean that I descend from that 5% of the people that survived. And that's a big light that's gonna go on in our heads and when that starts to happen, change is gonna come and we're gonna get to what we're trying to do when our people actually start realizing who we are. <laughs>